Welcome back to Edinley for our latest episode of Box 2 in partnership with Best Western Hotels GB, supporting local, proudly independent hotels. Well, have we got a special guest for you this week. Mike Bates is a human intelligence specialist and former covert counter-terrorism operations leader who recently became the fastest Briton to complete the world's toughest row solo. As the first officer in the history of the MOD to pass all relevant requirements to serve at the front line of the UK's counter-terror response, Mike's life undercover gave him a powerful and credible perspective on the human psyche. Today, Mike shares his unique experiences as a speaker, author and entrepreneur to help others. Rooted in his personal experiences of fighting terrorists, tackling Mother Nature at her most powerful and attaining his black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, all whilst trying to balance ever-changing family life. Mike provides a powerful and credible perspective on resilience, leadership, humility and overcoming adversity. Welcome back to Box 2 with myself, Jamie Jones Buchanan, in partnership with Best Western Hotels GB. And I've got a very special guest for you this week. It's, of course, the man himself, the real-life James Bond, Mike Bates, a.k.a. the Atlantic Grappler. Mike, fantastic to have you on Box 2. I've been waiting a long time to get you on. I think it's... First and foremost, worth telling everybody your relationship with the Leeds Rhinos, because it's not just somebody that I've plucked out of the air, superstar that i found in the street. You have got a tangible link to the Leeds Rhinos. We are great friends, good friends. I consider Mike as being one of my inner circle, those people that you surround yourself with and hope influence you on a daily basis. This guy is definitely one of them. Uh, Kev's within that as well and, and a few others. But 18 months ago, I came to a charity event here at the Leeds Rhinos for Paul Caddick. And I sat next to Johnny Gresham, used to play at Uddersfield. And he told me about this guru, martial arts expert, uh, jiu-jitsu up in uh, Roundy. And I was at the time doing a little bit of combat, some tackle work with our first team and was exploring, and it's not new, exploring the concept of the manipulation of the human body and jiu-jitsu experts are the experts at taking people down the ground. So we invited Mike in, we had a roll around on the mats, we bonded a relationship and uh, you became a part, a peripheral part of the Leeds Rhinos. What do you remember about those times? Well, thanks for the introduction. I mean, that is, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a fantastic um, intro, Jamie. Thank you. I remember coming in and being, you see, I've been around contact for a long time. We're going to talk probably about my military career. I've, I've, you know, I'm used to combat. Um, but what shocked me the most was the intensity of the players in training. Uh, and it's something, unless you as a fan, have been up close in that environment, yards away from someone, you know, really uh, moving towards someone with intent. It's, uh, it's a surprising thing. I loved it. I loved how the players really were open to learning new information. And I was actually surprised that, you know, even though we're talking about the, the best athletes here, there was still information that was missing in the jigsaw puzzle around grappling. And so if I've been able to put a few pieces in from then I'll be really proud about it. Tell us a, a bit, a synopsis of Mike Bates. And it's really difficult. If you Google Mike Bates, it's pretty fragmented. You get a flavour of what this guy's all about. But because of your background in the military, we've got to be really careful about what we disclose. You can probably guess what his former career was just by that information. But give us, a, in a nutshell, who is Mike Bates? Well, that's the biggest question anyone can ask anyone, isn't it? Well, I would say he's a family man and he's a friend yeah. more than anything else. Uh, but my, my purpose in life, in fact, I was talking to Kev about this. Um, my purpose in life is to help people. And so whatever I do, it's always been about, can I do something that's going to add value to someone else's life? So for half of my entire life, I served our country. Uh, first in the Royal Marine Commandos. I went to Afghanistan, Iraq, Northern Ireland in the early 2000s, post 9-11. In fact, I was in training, in commando training when 9-11 happened. I was then... Um, I moved over to the intelligence and security fields of the MOD 
I worked as a covert operations leader and I was in training there when 7-7 happened. Wow. So my whole adult life has been dominated by terrorism, uh, dominated by the mission to try and keep our country safe. And then in lockdown, and one of my, I suppose my tagline, if I want to say that, and I'll get this out now, is that we should be living a life without limits. And I believe you've got to practice what you preach. So in lockdown, when everyone was worried about the jobs, I left a really secure MOD career to start a jiu-jitsu business, a contact sport in lockdown where no one could go out. Wife thought I'd gone mad. And it's turned into one of the biggest academies in the UK. And now I do public speaking, thanks to, in part to you. I've just launched a new brand, Next45, which we'll talk about in a bit. So yeah, lots of stuff there in the last 20, 30 years, but all of it about trying to help people. You talk about a lot being your authentic self, and it's a value that I've really ingrained into who I am. In my post 45, I'm not 45 years old yet, I'm 42, but I am redefining, trying to understand what that next chapter is for me. And we went to Iceland back end of 2022 and really discovered what that might look like for me. And it was a pretty traumatic time. I don't mind saying it wasn't horrendous, but I had some things I had to uncover. You, you mentioned the authentic self there, being true to who you are. There's a real safety in that. And by that, I mean, if you've got some values, and you behave and adhere to those values all the time, then it's very hard to get things wrong. Even if other people disagree with those values, by being the authentic self every time, you never or rarely deviate. And it's really interesting. I listened to a conversation recently talking about politics, and I don't get into politics too much, but it was talking about in the olden days, people used to fall on the sword, hold their hand up and resign when they made a mistake. These days, they just carry on going. Now, the, the ones, in, f as far as I can see, who have the most virtue are the ones that are consistent to the values that they preach. You're talking about practicing what you preach. And as long as they don't waver too much from that, regardless of whether people like it or not, they seem to hold them in higher regard and allow them to stay in power. Just tell us really quickly how important it is to be your authentic self. Well, I think there's a, there's a consistency, isn't there, in, in those individuals who firstly have thought about what they believe yeah. because I don't think we do that often enough you know when was the last time you really looked inward and said who am I who do I want to be who have I been and where do I want to go and I think we have to do that almost on a const constant basis you know Viktor Frankl who wrote a fantastic book Man's Search for Meaning about his time in Auschwitz talked about the existential vacuum and that's when there are no goals and there is no purpose and no drive we have to have that because unfortunately the existential vacuum is a, a vacuous space where depression and anxiety lurks. If we know where we're going and we know who we want to be yeah. at the very end, those decisions you talk about, we're able to make the right ones because we know the direction of travel. Yeah, and we have a great quote about that, don't we? About, you know, if you don't know which port you're sailing to, no wind is favourable, like you have to know where you're going. <laughs> You love that one, don't you? The, oh, that and the, the tide rising. I think people have started to copy it on Sky Sports. Rising, rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, yeah. yeah amen to that. And, uh, it has, it's, and it's encouraging you absolutely right. Every morning you get out of bed. And I've got some values. I might throw them up on screen here. And I see this every time I go into my gym and train. I train every single day. Um, and it's not a, so much physical. It's as much a meditation getting the early morning sunshine in my eyes, the oxygen through my nose and just starting the day uh, really well. Let's talk really quickly about jiu-jitsu because in many ways it's a, a metaphor for life in the same way that rugby league was for me. If I go and speak about success or relationships and love and camaraderie, I often try and use the metaphor of the parallels within sport around the context of rugby league because that's what I know. Really interestingly, you do something similar with jiu-jitsu because when you're grappling with men, women, whoever that might be, and you've got somebody around your neck who could potentially choke you out cold, you've got to have a great deal of trust within that. Just just tell us your insight into that. Mm. Well, there's two things with Brazilian jiu-jitsu that I absolutely love. The first is the fact that it's honest. And I would imagine rugby league is very similar to this. There's no hiding on the pitch. Everyone sees who you are yeah. when you get hit hard or when you're down a few points or you're ahead in jiu-jitsu it's the same you know the mat is a mirror to your character are you someone who puts others first are you someone who can't lose are you someone who is open to developing and humble we see all that in jiu-jitsu because it is as you said if someone's got their arm around your neck it's life or death um, but with that comes trust 
and a shared adversity. And I think the thing that the Marines do so well, and I saw this with the Rhinos as well, is that when you suffer with others, you build bonds that are unbreakable. And that is really the most powerful thing about Jiu-Jitsu. If we talk about at Gracie Bar Round A Leeds, we're not teaching people Jiu-Jitsu, we're developing people. Jiu-Jitsu is the tool we use to do that, and I think it's the best tool. Um, but ultimately, what we're trying to offer people is a chance to be part of something bigger than themselves. And when we think about that, that really is, again, going back to purpose, what we're all longing for. Yeah. We'll talk in a moment, I'm sure, about my time on the ocean alone. I'm telling you, being with other people who care about you, sharing and giving back to others is absolutely what life's all about. <laughs> Mate, you've articulated it really well. You talk about shared pain. It was something that I experienced with my cohort of players in my generation. We're always working really hard together. And when you share adversity, it becomes a lot easier. Life's not fair, life's not easy. It's really difficult. But when you've got the right people around you, then you can get through it. There's nothing you can't achieve or overcome when you do it together. You know, do it for a mate with a mate. I think that's what Kevin Sinfield's been talking about for uh, a lot of months in the last couple of years. Interestingly, when I had that sort of interim period and when I was coaching, struggled even sometimes to get a group of lads to count together. So let's say you had to do 10 passes, count them out, one, two, three, really struggled to do it. But when you do it under fatigue on the hills at Roundy Park, for example, interestingly, they, they count louder than they ever have done. That, that idea of shared pain, I love it. You mentioned um, rowing the ocean there. We'll, we'll get into, into what that was. Before we do, you, you come in last year and you spoke to the lads uh, about your time in the, the Marines, in the military, jumping out of an helicopter, you know, and having that little bit of fear as well and understanding why you was doing it. Just give us a bit of an insight into some of the stories that you shared with the boys, bearing in mind that after you'd done the row, you came back again and told them exactly what you'd learned as well. Yeah, I mean, the thing I spoke to the lads about initially was unselfishness, and that is one of the commando Spirits, one of the kind of values, yeah. um, the ethos. So courage, determination, cheerfulness in the face of adversity, laughing when it's bad. We all know we should, that's hard to do, but we've got to do it. And unselfishness. And it's that unselfish nature of putting someone before you yeah. that builds those unbreakable bonds. So when you are struggling on the pitch that you know you can look left and right, the person next to you is going to have you back. You know, I, I, I gave the analogy of jumping into Afghanistan, you know, the most mined country in the world. Taliban were waiting for us, the Americans were taking heavy casualties in 2002 when we arrived as the first conventional British troops. And you don't leap off the back of a Chinook helicopter into that territory with your body weight on your back. Bearing in mind the night before we'd been told that they were expecting one in three to be a casualty, so we are expecting to take heavy losses. You only jump into that environment for other people. You're not thinking about medals, you're not thinking about how brave you or scared you are. You're thinking, get off this aircraft so your mate can get off. And your mate's thinking about, about you. And th when you've got that, there's, this, there's a feeling, and I've, I've probably not had it since, but I used to walk about a half an inch taller when I was in the Royal Marines because I felt like I had the whole commando brigade behind me. Um, and it's a wonderful thing, but it starts with you and it starts with putting other people first. I went and watched the uh, women play at Wembley, you know, making history this last weekend. We went to the cenotaph and laid a wreath for the, the servicemen and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And I always do so with a great deal of reverence and think about an alternative life where if I had to play rugby league, what would I have done? And I always think it would more likely have been the military than it would another sport, to be fair. I love that idea of camaraderie. And again, then parallels, whilst I've never jumped off a, a Chinook in Afghanistan or Iraq into a mined field, by any way, shape or form, I, I in many ways get the parallels that you're talking about there. Um, really important. Let, let's jump into rowing the Atlantic. We've got some pictures, but tell us how that came about. Now, so you've been in the military. How do you go from that to rowing such a formidable challenge? So both my children were born early. My, my, my eldest boy was five weeks early. We, we fed him through a tube for a few weeks. He were fine, and thankfully. My youngest boy was nine weeks early needed kind of life saving intervention um, he was ventilated and then we got him home and he was sleeping really well and i'd read all the parenting books jamie i'm sure you did as well you know you like to think you know what you're doing and uh, i was saying this is good he's sleeping he's catching up and my wife sarah who's amazing 
basically just said, ah, I've just got a funny feeling. Something's not quite right. I said, okay, well, if that's how you feel, you've got to take him to hospital. So Sarah took him to hospital. I went off to follow a terrorist around all day like you do. And um, I got a call about an hour later, so you've got to come back. And I walked into LGI, to Clarendon Wing, and he was there laid on a, on a slab. And the consultant was there and said, if you hadn't brought him in today, he'd have been dead tomorrow. Yeah. He had meningitis and he was in and out of intensive care again for some, quite some time. And it was in that experience where nothing else matters because your baby's fighting for the life. And we lost him a few times and they brought him back. You realise that it's not the NHS that fund the specialist equipment in, in our hospitals. It's charities. And so I felt this longing, and I did, I raised a few thousand quid straight after, but there was something in the back of my mind, uh, almost like a, a locked box of trauma that I needed to unlock and deal with. And every year on Gabriel's birthday, I'd get terribly upset, and I didn't know why. And I thought, I've got to repay this debt. So I kind of did the classic hit 40 midlife crisis. What's my life all about? We're all going to do this. We're going to talk about it in a moment in the next 45. Who am I? Where have I been? What am I going to do next? I've got to pay this debt off. So I thought, right, we're in lockdown. No one's got any money. What's the craziest thing I can find that hardly anyone's ever done to try and raise some money? And I discovered ocean rowing. And to row an ocean solo, there's more people climb Everest every year than have ever rowed an ocean. And there's only 100 or so people that ever rowed an ocean solo. And so I thought, I'm going to do that. And so I set off a campaign called the Atlantic Grappler in 2000. And last month, we handed over a cheque for £137,000 to Leeds Children's Hospital. We bought them six neonatal monitoring machines for the unit where Gabriel was. And then we've gifted 50000 to Rob's MND appeal. Yeah. And then another 22000 to the general kind of NHS trust. So I'm really proud about that. And um, I always say, and I need to say this now, it was a solo row, but it was a team effort. You know, back to your point, Jamie, nothing's done alone. You don't do anything on your own. Yeah. It's the collective effort of everybody around you that gets you across a 3,000 mile stretch of ocean alone, I can tell you. And I know you follow your humility and you're a very humble guy, but you were the quickest as well. Your kids were born early. You arrived early. I suppose adversity and success are parallel. But what did that mean to you? Because when you talk, you know, people ask you all the time, how do you prepare for something like that? And I've heard you say you can't prepare because there's so much untold, unseen. But you also talk about this prior wall of evidence, which is another phrase quote that I use far too often, nicked it off this guy here. You had a great deal of confidence in the preparation, but actually going out there in reality, there was so much that you can't prepare for. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think more than anything else, and I would say this as a metaphor for life, don't have any regrets. Yeah. So I, I knew I couldn't go onto the ocean. I couldn't take that first because there's over a million strokes on the oars. I couldn't take that first stroke out of the marina in La Gomera with any chink in my armour, with any thought or idea that maybe I cut some corners or maybe I didn't do things quite right. You know, so every, in the whole of that campaign, every New Year's Day at 5 a.m. I ran a, uh, rode a marathon, yeah. which meant I didn't drink the night before. I've stopped drinking now, I don't drink it at all because of it. Um, when everyone was out at the race start, going out and enjoying themselves, I was in bed at half eight. And I was the last person to leave the marina and no one wanted to leave last. But I felt so confident in my abilities, even though I was alone, that I could leave last. And I arrived first out of all the solos, beating many pairs and trios. In fact, I think I was the fastest British person ever to do the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge um, in 46 days. But it taught me a really valuable lesson, not just about the work that needs to go in to achieve those kind of challenges. It's the fact that the only thing that matters when you are stripped to the bone yeah. and you are alone in the middle of the Atlantic in huge weather is the people you love and care about. And I think if you have a chance to go and face something like that, it's a really cathartic moment because you see life for what it really is, Jamie. It's this, mate. It's looking into the eyes of a human being. I didn't see a human for 46 days and nights. I can tell you, this is what life's all about, mate. Interesting, a few things popping up to mind there. The idea of social isolation, an absolute killer. The worst thing I think human beings can be a part of is being isolated. You mentioned Viktor Frankl there. And at times you were so far from anybody else that you were actually closer to International Space Station. So closest person was in space. That's just mind blowing. Um, and you had this longing 
for connection. I was talking about connection over content. And listen, vulnerability is really important. When we went to Iceland, I mentioned it again, one thing you encouraged us all to do at the time was to be vulnerable. And I found it really powerful because people could probably sit at home and, and listen and watch this, think, wow, this guy is a superhero and can never achieve that. But actually, a lot of the success is born out of not just adversity, but vulnerability as well. Just give us a, a bit of a, an insight into what you mean by that. I think it's about being honest with yourself. I think too often we worry about what other people think too much about us. I think really we've got to be thinking about, again, we're back to our first question, really, our first point, who we really are. Yeah. And when you're suffering, you've got to tell people you're suffering. And when you're upset, you've got to be upset. Like that, you know, locking that stuff up because you are afraid of what other people might think is disastrous for your spirit. Like you have to be open with who you are. I think on the ocean, I tried to, and if anyone follows me on Instagram, Mike Bates underscore official, you'll see the whole ocean row played out on my Instagram. You can look back through the posts. Most days I cried. Um, I said to my wife and kids, I'd call them twice a week. I called them twice every day. And most of those conversations were me crying down the phone, longing to see them again. I mean, to the point of connection, Jamie, like, I, again, you're stripped to the bone here, emotionally, spiritually, physically. I was having conversations with the moon, the stars, the sun, any bird that passed, the dolphins, <laughs> anything to connect, again, anything to have something with, to share something with. Yeah. Um, it was a remarkable experience and one I'm really proud of. People ask me all the time, Mike, do I miss playing? And I don't miss playing. Um, I, th there's the game and then there's a the connection. It was the connection that I played rugby before. I still have that connection. You know, the, the game was incidental. I connect in different ways now through challenges. And, and it's so poignant what you're saying there. Um, MIND, M-I-N-D, it's an acronym. Um, to be broken down, and you mentioned there about public speaking, being a coach, a mentor, role model. Tell us a little bit about mind uh, and what that means. Yeah, so these are my principles for goal setting, really, and for anybody who wants to achieve any goal. And I do believe that these goals, whether they're you know health related or you know corporate or family, whatever it is, if you use these principles, and I think what I've learned over 20, 30 years of setting myself goals, becoming a Royal Marines commando, becoming a covert ops leader, rowing oceans, starting businesses, is that you have to have a process. <laughs> so MIND is really a framework for anybody just to take and just to put in place, and you can achieve anything with it. So M's for motivation. You've got to know why you're doing it. Yeah. Simon Sinek says start with why. You've got to start with why, but it's got to be intrinsic. I think too many of us are doing things for other people, Instagram likes, what other people might think. No, no, this is about you. And again, that comes back to thinking about who you are and where you want to be. So motivation. I used to say the I was inspiration, but one thing I'm really hot on is constantly evolving. So actually I've changed the I to intention. Right. I listened to my old company commander, the youngest ever company commander in the Royal Marines speak about two months ago. I've not seen him for 20 years, Chris <laughs> Payton. Um, he, en he ended up being um, David Cameron's top man in Afghanistan. And he talks a lot about the military orders and intent, your intention to do something, you know, saying you're going to do it and go and do it. So motivation, intention, the end is nerve, Jimmy. 92% of all goals set are never achieved. And that's because people don't start. They're waiting for the perfect time. You know, they say the best time to plant the trees 20 years ago, next best time is today. Like, just get on with it because... One thing is for sure, if you don't start, if you don't take that first step, however challenging you might feel it might be, nothing's going to happen. And that's the worst thing. And then finally, D is discipline. Jocko Willink speaks about discipline equaling freedom. I think when you've got a discipline and a work ethic and an honesty with who you are and what you're trying to do, you can feel at peace with yourself. So my mind principles, motivation, intention, nerve, discipline, take it put it into whatever you want to do and you'll be successful for sure. For those who want to get a deeper grasp into Mike Bass and what he's about, um, Andy Grant has got a great podcast. Now, Andy Grant um, is a military man as well. He's a Liverpoolian and he's got the world record for the fastest 10K missing a leg with, uh, without a leg. And uh, he's, a fan, he's an unbelievable speaker. We, he came to Iceland with us as well. You jumped on his podcast, didn't you, earlier on in the year, talked in depth 
about your journey. Just tell us one or two podcasts that people might be able to get further detail on your journey. Yeah, yeah. So for long form, yeah, the Leggett podcast with Andy Grant is a fantastic one. The Doratus Mind podcast with Gaz Bamford, Gary Bamford is another good one. Yeah. And there's plenty more. I think if you Google it, you'll, you'll find us. Um, and I can go into more detail. What I would say to anybody, and I mean this, genuinely mean this, is that if you want to find out more about what I'm up to or you want help or guidance, yeah. remember, I'm in the people helping business. Just send me a DM on Instagram and we'll sort it out. Beautiful. You've got a logo there on your left chest, a left pec, uh, next 45. Yeah. Um, in some ways, alluding to the second half of your life, assuming that 45 is a bit around that midway point, the midlife crisis point, if you like. I'm reading, uh, listening to a book called When, talks about the context behind when you do certain things. It plays a big role in life and outcomes. And it talks about that U curve, that U shape of about human happiness, that when we get to around between 40 and 50, we start to recognise our mortality. And anecdotally, quite lazily, people have gone, midlife crisis. So you end up either running ultra marathons, doing crazy stuff, <laughs> or you buy the, the Ferrari yeah. um, and the motorbike and think you're 20 year old again. Or, or even worse, people end up in crazy depression and, and addiction and all kinds of horrible stuff. In reality, it, it balls around this thing, this punctuated equilibrium, I believe, where we get to, and this is reoccurring with a lot of midpoint projects. So if you've got any sort of project, even half time throughout a game, there's a midpoint, and it's a real pivotal point where it can pivot in either direction. So give us that synopsis, and certainly those men who are reaching middle age, that anecdotal midlife crisis period, and what the next 45 means. So, I mean, just the logo itself is two mountains. So the U curve you spoke about, I envisage that as a valley between two mountains. Yeah. Your first mountain in life, the first half of your life, certainly as a man, I can only speak to this as a man, obviously, is all about striving. It's about, and you should be doing this, you should be striving to find a mate, to earn money, to start a family, that's what you should be doing. The problem is, as testosterone starts to drop and we enter into midlife, and we start to look backwards and forwards and look at our mortality, we often ask our question, ourselves the question, on the summit of that first mountain, is this the view that I thought it was gonna be? Maybe it's not. And a lot of people then descend into the valley of this kind of, this U curve you talked about, where they're unsure about, have I done the right thing? Do I need to do more? I feel like I should, but I know I need to spend more time with the kids, and oh my God, I've not spent enough time with the kids, and they're growing up, and my wife, and oh my, and it's, it's overwhelming for a lot of people. What we're trying to do in Next 45 is to help men get onto the second mountain, because the second mountain, the Next 45, is, as David Brooks talks about it, is your moral mountain. This is about, again, who are you? What do you want to be remembered for at the end of life? Because we're all going to get to the end. And you better have bloody thought about it because you're going to run out of time. And I think what I realised transitioning from a 20-year MOD military career into starting businesses, taking more risks, living that life without limits, is that a lot of men are in that spot. But a lot of men don't know what to do. And we know the statistics. I mean, let's just say, you know, three out of four, three out of, uh, four people who kill themselves are men. Uh, men are more likely to suffer and not ask for help. One in eight men suffer from a mental health issue. That's the ones who admit it. We're dreadful at looking after ourselves as blokes because there's been this culture in society to say, man up. You're a man, get on with it. Men are suffering. And what I want to say and talk about vulnerability to you guys is like, yes, I've been to war. I've done this, that, and the other road oceans. I'm as vulnerable and as broken as any man. And so if you feel like I do or like I did, and you feel like you want to find out what the next 45 can be, then just go to next45.com and we'll help you along that journey. Amen to that. It's really poignant and apt actually, the, the mental health around Rugby League recently, tackle the tough stuff. There's a lot of great stories within Rugby League about how um, men and our women as well have overcome adversity and used the connections around Rugby League to overcome those adversities. I, I love what you talk about there and fundamentally, my faith underpins my direction in life you know we talk about this a fair bit where we might slightly differ as well and you talk about the valley as i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i fear no evil because of my lord and savior you know i'm, I'm a christian jesus is my 
my direction, my intention, I guess. But walking up that, that second mountain, I think, is encouraging as well. Using that first journey, that first insight to augment who you're going to become on that second half. So when you're talking about mind, for me, my word is become. Uh, it starts with B and E and it ends with M and E. And that's a reminder of that um, authentic self being me to be the best version of me. I've got to be me. I can't be Mike Bates. I can't be Kevin Simpson. I can't be anybody else. I can only be me. Then the C-O in the middle, it stands for confidence, company, comedy, and one or two other things that keeps me driving. See it every single morning. Um, you've got a, a retreat coming up in September. I'm going to come to that. We're going to film it. We're going to get some content there. 100 fellas come in and uh, no messing about, just some real high quality content and speakers. Yeah, I mean, the next 45 is built around two things, really. Events for men. So we've got our inaugural event called The 100, um, happening this September at the historic Howard and Estate in Wales. Phenomenal um, place. We've got everything from world-class speakers. Andy Grant will be there. You'll be there. I'll do some talking. Joe Gaunt, Johnny Gration's talking. Alan Smart, Eleanor Snare. We've got ice baths with Brass Monkey. We've got a wild lake swim, paddle boarding. We've We've got a 17th century castle for group workouts, yoga, breath work, food over fire. It's going to be amazing. The whole idea there is to give men the opportunity to just step out of normal life for a moment. Yeah. And again, I got the opportunity to do that in the ocean, just to get off that treadmill and just say, OK, where do I want to be? And then we've got a multi-award winning app that one of our co-founders launched called HealthNav. And our community can live on the app then, track all their health vitals, find insights and the tools to be able to you know go and achieve those goals using those mind principles so it's going to be an amazing thing it's never been done before the challenge here is of course men are the least likely to ask for help yeah. and we're finding this blokes need help they want to do it but they don't admit it you've got to drop that ego fellas you've got to drop it you've got to be vulnerable and you've got to be the best person you can be Mike, tell me uh, about your book that's coming as well, because there's a fair bit of content coming up and you've had to be real careful with the MOD, what you can and can't say, but you want to articulate a really important message without obviously compromising that, that prior life. Yeah. So, you know, I'm working on a manuscript at the moment. Uh, I'd love to be able to write this book, sharing the lessons that I've learned from that covert career, really. But I'm also, I'm a patriot. Like, you don't serve your country for 20 years and then throw it under the bus. So I'm working hard and we had a meeting yesterday with my former employer to try and get together and be collaborative on this. Um, my sense is they don't want me to write it. I get it, but I do think the lessons that I learned are so impactful for people. That is the driving force behind this. This isn't about me sensationalizing what I did. This isn't about me saying that I'm a hero. This is about saying, these are the lessons that we've learned in that world, the covert world, the murky world of espionage, and how can we use those lessons to benefit the lives of everybody else. So I'm hopeful we'll get it done. It's going to be a difficult path, but Jamie, if you know me, man, those just it, the more difficult it is, the more drawn to it I am. So <laughs> bring it on. Last question, I suppose, for me. People, again, like vulnerabilities and challenges. Uh, and, and I'm always asking this question because life's never easy, always reinventing yourself. And I like what you said there about intention rather than inspiration. What are some of your biggest fears or challenges that you yourself have to overcome either daily, weekly, monthly? Oh, I think, I think the thing I struggle with the most is being kind to myself. I think I expect a lot from me and I could give myself a break. You know, something as simple as, and we're talking about vulnerability, so I don't mind being honest. I've always had a dreadful relationship with my own body. I don't like the way I look. And that's hard for a guy to say that because we instantly feel shame when we say that, and, and it is shameful to say it. So when I go away on an all-inclusive like I did last week and live in the all-inclusive buffet, <laughs> as we all do, and I put three kilos on in a week, I come back really guilty. I wish I could give myself a break because it doesn't matter. No one cares. It's just me. And I'm sure it'll resonate with a lot of people. So the biggest fear, I suppose, is that when I get to the end of life, I'll turn around and go, you should have cared less about that. This, the five regrets of dying that Bronnie Ware speaks about, this palliative care nurse in Australia. And one of them is that I wish I'd cared less about what other people thought of me. Yeah. I wish I'd worked less. 
I wish I spent more time with my family. So my biggest fear is that maybe I don't get it right. But I think as long as I'm recognising that now, I give myself every chance to get it right. I think the worry for me is, particularly men, we're not thinking about it. We're just cracking on. You're going to come unstuck at some point. I think my biggest challenge is dietary also. And it's cognitive dissonance, isn't it? You, you, you talk about being kind to yourself and I, you know, it, it's in conflict with this idea of discipline because you go away by being kind, you feel like you're moving away from that discipline and it is without doubt um, the food side of it. Everything else I'm um, encouraged and supported by gentlemen like this. Mike, thank you very much for joining us here in Box 2. Um, it's been a great insight. I'm going to carry on this conversation. I'm sorry, but we've run out of time here this time round. But this weekend, back at Edinley Stadium, there's loads going on. And not just at Edinley Stadium either. Down in Sheffield, our wheelchair rugby league team will be playing in the Challenge Cup final against the Catalan Dragons. And that'll be shown live on the BBC iPlayer at 1pm and also on the BBC website and app, meaning that, well, you could be here preparing for the Warrington game whilst hopefully watching our wheelchair rugby league team bring home yet another Challenge Cup trophy. If not here at Edinley Stadium, there's absolutely loads going on. It's the return of our famous Family Day at Edinley Stadium on the 20th of August as we host our first triple header of the season as our women's, men's and reserve teams all take on the Warrington Wolves. Gates open at 12pm and here's what you can expect to see. Starting with the South Stand, you can grab a selfie with Pete the Dino, get up close and personal with your creepy crawlies or battle it out at the game station van. Enjoy live music from Loud Noises Brass Band under the concourse and make sure you visit our face painters and balloon modellers. Head to the courtyard by the club shop for more animal delights from the fantastic York Bird of Prey Centre and try out your look at our carnival stalls. Prepare to be transported to a galaxy far far away with our Star Wars takeover. Let the force be with you as your favourite characters come to life around the ground. Ever met a real life transformer? Well, you're in luck as everybody's favourite Autobot, Bumblebee, will be joining us for a special guest appearance on Sunday. And finally, get in early and save 50% on all draft pints up to 1pm. Our self-service e-bars will be located in front of the Headingley Lodge and near the Western Terrace. Following the men's game, the South Stand Bar will remain open with a player interview on podium straight after the Hooter. There's something for everyone, so come join us this Sunday. Big thanks to Mike Bates. Thank you very much, mate, for joining us in Box 2. Have a wonderful week and hope to see you Sunday. God bless.